So it looks like the splatter film, so to speak, capitalized on disgust, and, hor and the, the, the sense of horror is partly fear, but also partly disgust. And so the disgust sensitivity system looks very old evolutionarily, although it, it looks particularly well developed in human beings, because it's not that obvious. It's not that obvious that animals show disgust the same way human beings do. I mean, think about dogs, right? Jesus, those things, they're, they're like, everything smells good to a dog. You know, and they'll eat virtually anything too. And, but humans aren't like that at all. We're very picky, maybe because we're omnivorous. I don't exactly know. We're very picky. And, you know, there's also specific facial expressions that are associated with disgust. You know, they're like that. And it's partly an expulsion facial expression. You're closing your eyes so you don't have to see it. You're closing your nose so you don't have to smell it. It's like repulsion and re repugnance are associated with disgust sensitivity. Being sensitive to disgust seems to go along with a lot of other things, like black and white moral thinking. It's like things are either good or they're not, and there's no gray area in between. And, and like anorexics are like that to a, to a great degree. Like it's black or white. There's no gray at all. And um, they're also very judgmental people who are orderly. And I think the black and white thinking goes along with the with the with the judgment. It's like, well, you're either doing well or you're not. There isn't. There's no mucking about in the middle. And so they're hard on themselves, orderly people, but they're also hard on other people. And one of the things we know, for example, is that if you're conscientious, although it predicts workplace success and that sort of thing, and general well-being, if you're conscientious and you become unemployed, you're in real trouble because, you know, maybe because you're conservative in your fundamental orientation, you think all those people without jobs, they're just fundamentally useless, and, you know, if they just tried harder, they would get to where they're going, which, of course, has some truth to it, but not completely. So then you fall into that category and well then you're kind of they say hoist with your own petard right because now you're among the the great unwashed and because you're disgust sensitive that's not going to make you very happy. So conscientious people suffer a lot when things happen to them that are bad because they also assume because they seem to be very fond of willpower they also assume that well with just enough effort and with just enough willpower you can get yourself out of out of anything and you know, that's sort of true. If you put a lot of effort into something, the probability that you'll do well increases. But that isn't the same as if you try hard enough, you can get out of anything, right? You know, you know what I mean? The grayness there really matters. So, because um, there's lots of things that hard work isn't going to get you out of. And sometimes persisting and perseverating at something is actually the wrong thing to do rather than the right thing to do. So it's very tricky. So the orderly types are conservative. To make you conservative, you have to be high in orderliness and low in openness, especially the more creative element of openness, say, rather than the intellect element. So, so that's interesting, too, because, of course, people tend to think that their political preference is established by their rationality. You know, I'm a liberal because being a liberal is the right way to be, and here's a bunch of reasons why that's the right way to be, and, you know, I've thought that through, and that's why I'm a liberal. It's like, turns out that's probably completely wrong, or at least mostly wrong. You have your temperament. And your temperament makes you intrinsically value certain things. And then because you intrinsically value them, the arguments about why those things are good are attractive to you, and then you remember those arguments. And so liberals, for example, are much more concerned with harm and care than conservatives are. And conservatives are more concerned about things like purity. And so, and those are basic, you know, those are basic, you should be concerned about both of those things. So the purity issue, it's like, well, what happens if your living quarters are filthy and, and your hygiene habits are terrible? The answer to that is your house gets full of parasites, rats and mice and bugs, and you get sick and then you die. And so, and maybe people around you do too. So, you know, the purity issue really matters. You don't want to eat rotten meat. You want to make sure it's stored properly. You don't want to have the rats eat all your grain. So your granaries have to be in really good order and there can't be any holes in them and so on. And so, like orderliness and food preservation and, and preservation from illnesses and contamination and all those sorts of things, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's really important. You can't, you can't just push that away and say it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant at all. So, but then again, you can make it too relevant, you know. So one of the things you see with the anorexics is that, you know, they're so sensitive to disgust that they can't stand their own bodies. And that's a weird thing, right? Because, like, is a body a good thing or a bad thing? Well, here, here's an example. So here's an experiment. So you, have, you give someone a sterilized cup, and you say, well, you know, 
put some saliva in the cup, and then you let it sit for 10 seconds, and then you say, well, drink that. Right, now a lot of you are going like this, right? And that's disgusts, and now you won't do that. But then you might ask, well, why? Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, it was in your mouth like 10 seconds ago. So, like, what's the big problem? Well, people, people won't do it. And you can see a heuristic at work there, right? The heuristic is, don't drink saliva. And it's not, like moderated by any sort of trivial situational determinants, you're just not going to do it. But I suspect that you do kiss your partner, for example. Right? And then you think, oh, well, that's kind of a weird exception. It's like, oh, well, my partner turns out not to be disgusting. At least that's what you hope. And then, <laughs> and so, you know, there's this, and that, you know, and, and there's also this weird inhibitory process that goes on between sexual attraction and disgust, too. You know, and, and the psychoanalysts you know, they, were, they thought of that as something that was perhaps somewhat pathological, sexual guilt, sexual shame, disgust, and all that. But as far as I can tell, it's a, it's, a, it's a biological moderating factor. And part of the reason for that is, well, you know, just how many sexually transmitted diseases do you actually want to have? Especially given that many of them are, you know, syphilis in the 19th century. Man, that was, that was deadly. It was transmissible from generation to generation. It, it acted like every other kind of disease, and there wasn't any cure for it. And then, of course, we had AIDS in the 1980s. We kind of got a handle on that, but it was just bloody luck, you know? And it was very transmissible. And so sexual contamination is a big issue, and it always has been for the human race because it turns out that sexual activity is a really good way of transmitting disease. So, you know, the, the borderline between disgust as something that protects you in your life and discuss as something that turns you off of life completely. It's, it's a really tight and, and contradictory set of like mutual inhibiting forces. It's a real problem for people. So, okay, so, so, so what, do you, what do you have? Orderliness, okay, orderly people are black and white thinkers. They're judgmental. If uh, you talk, if you show orderly people Imagine that you have them, dis you describe to them some kind of crime, like maybe it's living off the uh, fruits of prostitution. So maybe you talk to them about a pimp, and you know, you give them a little story about the pimp, and then you say, How long should this pimp be thrown in jail? It's like the orderly people think you just lock them up and throw away the key. You know, they're, they're, they judge moral transgressions very harshly. And so that's part, of the, that's part of the aspect that's judgmental. They're not egalitarian either. They don't think that everybody should have the same amount all the time. They're pretty, they're pretty interested in hierarchy and structure. And, you know, there's some real advantages to hierarchy. Um, it, it, people think that they'd be happier in an egalitarian situation, but the problem with egalitarian situations is people are always arguing. Right, because no one's right in an egalitarian situation. They're just, everybody gets to have their opinion, and it's like... You know, when are we going to stop with all the opinions and do something? And the thing about a hierarchy is, the advantage to a hierarchy is, there are things you are responsible for, but there's also things you're not responsible for. And that's a big advantage, and then you also know who is responsible for those things. So it looks like people are more comfortable in hierarchies than they think, even if they're liberals. So that's kind of interesting too. So, uh, 